Well, hello, bed crimers. I wanted to give you a little bed crime bite tonight with some new information on the case against Brian Koberger. Within the next 27 days, prosecutors will have to decide if they plan to seek the death penalty. News Nation spoke to their sources, who are said to be close to the investigation, who told them that several of the victims' families have met with prosecutors and have made their thoughts about the death penalty versus a life sentence known. The count per Ashley Banfield is as follows. Zana Kernodal's mother, Kara Northington, has spoken to prosecutors and she told them that she wants the guilty party to spend the rest of his or her life in prison. Zana's father, Jeff Kernodal, told prosecutors he wants the death penalty. And we all know that the Gonsalves family also wants the death penalty, as does Maddie Mogan's family. As for Ethan Chapin, his family hasn't spoken out publicly about this issue, but they've said many times that nothing they will do will bring back Ethan or can change what happened. This sort of indicates to me personally, that they would prefer a life sentence versus the death penalty. I think they would take pity on the Koberger family. That's just me speculating. I don't know them, so I could be totally wrong. We also learned today that new orders regarding cameras in the courtroom and the non-dissemination order or gag order have been issued. The filings include an order continuing courtroom access for news media cameras. That's a win, but reserving the right to further modify camera access at a future date. So that sounds like they can change their mind when it comes to the trial. The filings also included a revised non-dissemination order. Accompanying it are two other orders addressing earlier motions to revise or vacate the previous non-dissemination or gag order. It sounds like the media is still going to be restrained by that gag order. The judge also ruled to deny the Gonsalves' family attorney, Shannon Gray, from speaking about the case to the media. He is still restricted from speaking, and that is to protect Brian Koberger's right to a fair trial by an impartial jury. We're also learning that Koberger's attorney, Ann Taylor, is fighting against the prosecution's motion for a protective order regarding its investigative genetic genealogy analyses. Ann Taylor wrote, quote, there's no explanation for the total lack of DNA evidence from the victims in Mr. Koberger's home, office, or vehicle. If you found that statement confusing, you're not alone. Here's what else Ann Taylor said, as narrated by Ashley Banfield of News Nation. She argued, in essence, through the lack of disclosure and their motion to protect the genetic genealogy investigation, the state is hiding its entire case. Banfield then had a defense attorney on to explain what this may mean. So this guy said that from all reports we've had, this was a very violent, very messy crime scene. He's saying because of the close quarters in the house where the crimes occurred and because of the nature of the weapon used, it would be very difficult for the perpetrator to walk away without a lot of the victim's DNA all over him or her. And then if that person did have all that DNA from the victims on himself or herself, it's going to show up in his or her car, in his or her home, basically everywhere that perpetrator goes post the crime. The defense lawyer said the fact that we don't have that kind of stuff, meaning that kind of DNA evidence, or perhaps that we haven't seen that kind of stuff or evidence... At least the defense says that they haven't. This defense attorney said that's a big deal. This defense attorney also said that could possibly point to Koberger not being the perpetrator. He followed that comment up with this. And, uh, could, I think go, that could it go the other way around? I wonder um, if Koberger had any kind of relationship with any four of these victims and they've been to his apartment or his car or his office, then there'd be a perfectly good explanation as to why his DNA might be on Maddie's bed or transferred to a knife sheath that some stranger dropped there. Uh, you know, that would certainly be something else as well. But um, it, 
it, it looks to me like that's the, the strategy they're developing is that, you know, Kohlberger uh, was not, uh, if, uh, you know, there. What the defense attorney there was trying to say is that the defense strategy will be to use that lack of DNA evidence to say that Koberger wasn't at the house when the crime occurred. I want to talk a little bit more about that DNA evidence. We know that the released affidavit said that DNA recovered from the sheath was at least 5.37 octillion times more likely to be seen if Koberger is the source than if an unrelated individual randomly selected from the population is the source. Many people are wary of DNA testing in criminal cases. They don't trust the labs that test the DNA, and they question if somebody could have planted the DNA at the crime scene. DNA expert and Boise State professor Dr. Greg Hampakian told Idaho News 6 this about that 5.37 octillion number. He said, quote, those numbers are not like the force of gravity or E equals MC squared. They're calculations that give us some idea of the weight of the match, the confidence, but this is a very strong match, end quote. But while this man admits that it's a very strong match, he said he still has some questions, and these are the questions. One, did Koberger touch the sheath? Two, did somebody else touch it with his DNA on their hands? Three, did he touch it a long time ago? Four, was there a mix-up in the laboratory or by the police? And five, did someone plant it? I think it's safe to say that Koberger's defense team is probably going to be posing these same questions, and this is how they're going to attack the DNA evidence at trial. This DNA expert also went on to say that the police have special use of public genetic genealogy databases. He said, quote, they can use the databases in a similar way that I can, but I can only do it for my DNA. They can do it for your DNA, end quote. He's concerned about the use of these public databases, and he wants us all to know that our DNA could be used by authorities when they submit it to these companies. Personally, I'm okay with that. I'm not fearful that I'm going to be implicated in a crime, knock on wood, but I do understand the privacy issues and the privacy concerns. This turned into more than a bed crime bite. I'm going to leave it at that. I'll see you next time on Bed Crime Stories. Please smash that like button. It's a free way you can help me. It doesn't take that much time.